This is Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Hanam. And this is Jamal Dejani. Jamal, we got uh, a very active, busy, breaking news show today. We're going to be covering the deal of the century where the United States and Jared Kushner and Donald J. Trump have decided to institutionalize and make formal the deal of the century, which is formalizing apartheid in Bantustans and colonial expansion in historic Palestine. We'll be getting to that. We'll be talking about the impeachment. But there's a couple of other breaking news we just wanted to let our listeners know about. The WHO has, in fact, declared a global health emergency uh, with the coronavirus. So uh, we want our listeners to be very aware of this. Uh, in my humble opinion, the WHO was very slow in announcing this. The rate of expanse and expansion of this disease in China, in Asia, in the United States, in Europe, and now in Italy, by the way, uh, is growing at a very rapid rate. And uh, uh, we will be talking about this at some point. But finally, the WHO, in fact, did, uh, did finally decide to announce that. The other breaking news that we'll talk about later in the show, Jamal, is that U.S. officials are investigating a document that instructs border agents to profile Iranians, Palestinians, and Lebanese. So something that you and I have been talking about for decades now about how you know, Arabs, Muslims, Palestinians, Iranians, all of us have they been... They win the lottery every time. We win the lottery all the time. Well, it now seems like there's documentary evidence to support the idea that the United States government has been... Pro is, is, is tasked with profiling these groups. So, um, before I hand it over to you, I think, you know, you and I have been talking about the Kushner peace plan for how many years now? About two years? Three years. Three years we've been... Well, ever since it, uh, basically, if you remember, three years ago, pretty much. Yeah. And that, so... Uh, you know, you have uh, Donald Trump. He was talking about uh, that peace in the Middle East was not as difficult as people have thought. And that and if anybody is, could do it, Jared could. And, yeah, if, and anyone, if Jared exactly, couldn't do it, nobody could nobody do it. Nobody could do it. So this was... Uh, you know, the, the entire world, not just I don't, has been waiting for this announcement and the unveiling of this plan. And if you recall, there were at least three or four different occasions that when they said, oh, they were ready to announce the plan and then they'll push it a few more months. Right. Or let's wait after the Israeli elections. And I'm talking about the previous Israeli elections. Let's wait until the end of the year. Let's wait until the beginning of the year and different, different stories. So now, after three years of anticipation finally. and major hype. Finally. Finally, the so-called deal of the century was... Un announced. Un announced and unveiled. But can we just put that in context before you give us the details, Jamal? It's announced on, on, a, on a Tuesday in the middle of impeachment hearings, number one. It's announced with Bibi Netanyahu, who on the same day that this peace plan was in, unveiled, he was indicted by, you know, Israeli judicial system. And lastly, and perhaps more importantly, Jamal, there were no Palestinians at the announcement of the deal of the century. So let's just put that as a context. You have a peace plan, allegedly, between two peoples, and you are announcing this on the world stage. I'll make it more simple to you. <laughs> you have a wedding, and the bride is absent. <laughs> the bride is You have a marriage, you have a wedding ceremony, <laughs> and Trump is the priest or the sheikh or the rabbi who is basically going to, you know, Deliver the sermon, and you have the bride is missing. Is missing. Yes. So this this no. is, was the unveiling of this but the, so called peace plan. But but the bride isn't even invited. That's right. So not only is the bride missing, she's not even invited. Not even invited, or had anything to do with the planning, with the negotiation, with the border drawings, with the population transfer that they are suggesting because yeah. there is a population transfer. Listen, let's not just waste our time. Let's not just actually keep deceiving ourselves. 
This is a plan to launch apartheid. This is a plan of bent to stands yeah. for Palestinians. This is a plan where you're saying, we're, we're going to take over your land, like we're going to take over your house, but we're going to lock you in in the attic maybe or in the basement, and we're going to control everything. But by the way, you get to live in your house, and we'll bring you some food and some water. But you can't control the water. You can't control everything. You can't control anything. the elix- you can't control the land. S- anything. So this is so this is a plan. It's it's really a farce. It's a major farce. And if anyone believes that it had anything to do with with peace, they are deceiving and they are del- themselves and they are delusional. Listen, I mean. This is something, by the way, is not new. If you look at the plan itself, and we've talked about it but there's nothing many new, times. But there's nothing new in this plan. It has been designed by Benjamin Netanyahu. Let's let, you know, take away all that charade. I went through, through the entire plan, word by word, page by page. If you want to take the maybe two-thirds of it, which was basically looked like a real estate transaction right. part of it. And the other part of it about the economy, something that was probably devised and written by some officials at the USAID office. This is how you create a proposal when it comes to like, you know, empowerment, economy, etc. cetera. Yeah. That, that's basically was the two, two thirds of the plan with some maps, show and tell. But the first part or the one third of, of those uh, pages that, Jared Kushner bragged about saying we have 180 pages or what have you. We have a serious document. The hundred, the first one third, those were the exact concoction of Benjamin, Netanyahu. of Benjamin Netanyahu going back to Decades 2000. Ago. No, it was actually very well known 2011. Okay, you know, and 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 you could see the key points. So. You know, so the U.S. The, peace plan was written by a, by a, a foreign leader of another country. It's a hundred percent the design of Benjamin Netanyahu and his helpers, as in Hebrew we'll say Sanyanims. That's the word for helpers, which included Jared Kushner. It included Greenblatt. Green, Greenblatt. It included Freeman. You know, our ambassador uh, in in Jerusalem. And no Palestinians. And no Palestinians, and then some some other advisors. Look at it word by word. This is something. In fact, if you look at the border, it actually follows the apartheid wall. It does. I mean, if you look at the apartheid wall, when when Palestinians were saying, "Oh my God, they're taking our land. They're div- they're stealing our land. They're splitting families. They're splitting villages in half." And people saying, oh, you're being paranoid. The apartheid wall or, or the fence, as they refer to it, is just for Israeli security. It's not. It's Kalandia, Kalandia, which Israel refers to it as Atarot, which is, by the way, the Kalandia airport, and they changed the name to Atarot, is going to be a major tourist and travel section. It's kind of like a major border section. This is part of the design. They're saying they're going to bring tourists there. They've been like, for you know, they're creating this whole idea with now they want to add to it a shopping center, a mall, you know, so you it's could... A, it's, like, it's, it's real estate development. Yeah, and this this is actually, this was designed by who? By Jared Kushner in Washington, D.C.? This was designed by Benjamin Netanyahu and team years ago. They've been working on, on this. Then you have all these different key points that the media doesn't talk about it. You know, when we talk about, oh, maybe it's not apartheid. Well, maybe it is this, it is not that. It has all the key elements, you know, of apartheid, including, which is a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention, population transfers. That's right. So within that, there is a clause that says that Israel would transfer Palestinians with Israeli citizenships living in the Muthalath, and this is the Galilee area, you know, uh, Arab towns majority, basically, like Umm al-Fahim, they will actually make them now, they take away their Israeli citizenship and move them to the, Palestine, the so-called future Palestinian state. Right. Do you know the number? 
I'm afraid to ask. Of the population of people who will be transferred and affected, 250,000. That's unbelievable. One quarter of a million people. And it just shows you that Israel wants the land without the people. Exactly. Without the Palestinians. So they're trying to play games. And in return, they'll give them an empty, desolate piece of property, piece of land in the desert, in the part of the Negev, yeah, the Negev. where nothing grows there, basically. And say, well, here. So they take a very fertile area with the large, they want to get rid of these Palestinians so they don't have, you know, they, so they won't have any rights and any claims to their homes. Transfer them to the so-called future Palestinian state, an entire quarter of a million of them. And so, so, so it has this. And then a little conciliation prize are saying, well, Palestinians in Jerusalem, they can maintain the status quo, meaning as slaves, well, as green card holders, uh, if we want to say in this country, or as temporary residents, because not even permanent residents, or they can choose to become Israeli citizens or Palestinian citizens. That's, this is when we talk about now the makeup of the population. Now, everything else is controlled by Israel. The whole Jordan Valley is, aside from annexing it, it's all the entries into Jordan, travel, etc., through the Alanbi Bridge, the Sheikh Hussein Bridge, others, is in the hands of the Israelis. Palestine will not have an airport. No. It will not have a port. They'll have to use the port of Ashdod, and, uh, and, uh, and, and also they'll have to travel through Jordan to use a, an airport. There, is, there are no plans in that even though there was an airport in Gaza which Israel has destroyed so you won't have an international in fact they are suggesting in the future that Palestinians might have a port a man-made port away from the coast of Gaza and also where it is manned by Israeli border patrol agents so let's just cut to the chase Jamal and, and then Let, let's just cut to the chase it, it gets it gets it gets even but it's, worse but than this you didn't mention the tunnel yeah and then and then yeah connecting the, through tunnels bridges uh, tunnel between certain, Ga certain between, roads between Gaza and the West Bank yeah. a total joke they talk about this is a contiguous and last but not least Palestinians will have no claim, zero, not 1%, not 3%, zero claim over Jerusalem. So, so there is no Jerusalem as their capital. Don't fall, ladies and gentlemen, uh, pry to the razzle and dazzle and the language that they say, oh, they'll have a state of in part of East Jerusalem. It's not true. Abu Dis is not East Jerusalem. That's a suburb. This is like someone saying to you, well, you know, you're going to have a state, let's say San Francisco is the state, and you're going to have your a part of it, but it's going to be in Walnut Creek. Your capital will be, yeah. uh, San Francisco will be Walnut Creek. Will, will, and, and let's call it San Francisco. So they're talking about right. Abu Dis, and they are talking about uh, Shafat, by the way, Shafat refugee camp, which is very crowded and which actually under Israeli control and Isra Israel itself has a problem controlling it. So they want to get rid of it. And of course, Kalandia, which is a crowded Palestinian refugee camp and, uh, and, and that whole area which has been problematic for Israel that they don't want to have anything to do with it, the infrastructure. You know, the recent incident, you know, for example, of this boy drowning uh, in uh, the Shafat right. area because Israel does not maintain the infrastructure in that area, in the Palestinian neighborhoods. That's why there was, because of the rains, there was a big pond that right. formed by the drain and the poor little Palestinian boy was found dead there. Yeah, he drowned. He drowned there. So they want to get rid of these areas where you have high Palestinian uh, concentration and then sell it to the rest of the world and say, well, you're close enough. This is, call it Al-Quds. You can call it Al-Quds, which is the Arabic name for Jerusalem. And let's pretend, let's play a game and call it Al-Quds. And then on top of this, yes, and this is something I don't know because people have, if they've been reading the nuances in this language, on top of this, Part of the clause, they want to divide Al-Haram al-Sharif between Muslims and Jews. Unbelievable. So they have it, and they're saying that there'll be days assigned 
for Muslims to pray like what they've done in Al Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron, which is basically this is like the major, major I would say toxic point to even start discussing, and this is the dream of those fanatic settlers who yeah. want to destroy Al Aqsa Mosque and they want to take over and rebuild the. Jewish temple, that's what they have in their mind. So as a first step, which by the way, this is now under the Islamic Waqf, which is in charge, and, and actually Jordan. Yeah, the King Kung Hussein is Yeah, it's under, to... under, under Jordan and the Islamic Islamic decree well, or King, a, a King Islamic Waqf. Double now, yeah. And now they're saying, you know, we're going to start something new. We're going to take turns. And well, people can come and pray there. But Jamal, why don't... So, so if you read it, it's totally, this whole plan, Jess, it's created not only to antagonize Palestinians, but also to bully them into... Accepting. Accepting something that will totally destroy their national ident identity and aspiration. Well, Jamal, I think that's a really excellent analysis. And we should... Uh, really call this what it is, which is a grand peace plan, as you said, without the, br uh, like a marriage with a bride not even being invited. The Palestinians objected to this plan. They dismissed the plan. They were not part of the negotiations. Even before it was announced, Jamal, the Palestinian Authority and Palestinians themselves have completely rejected this plan. Now, if you understand peace plan, it typically means peace between people that have come together and come to an agreement. Let's be clear, Jamal, and to our listeners, this is not a peace plan. This is an apartheid plan. This is an attempt to institutionalize between the United States and the Israelis a way to continue to occupy historic Palestine, to ethnically continue to ethnically cleanse. And actually, Jamal, this grand peace plan is 10 times, if you can believe it, is 10 times worse than Oslo. 10 times worse than Oslo. And I, I feel like this is really important. I want to make two points so that we can kind of further the discussion. They interviewed Jared Kushner. I know one of your favorites. And Jared Kushner had the audacity to say, more or less, the Palestinians can either take it or leave it. Well, he said, actually, what he said was worse. He was just saying, insulting Palestinians as being stupid. He that they are basically, and he's quoting from this myth of Abba Iban, who always used to say, Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an, to opportunity. Miss an opportunity. So basically saying, which is, of course, I'm going to force you, like I said, to live in your at, in the attic of the house that you used to own against your will, and every time you tell me no, then you missed an opportunity to accept living either in the attic or in the basement right. when I controlled 90% of the house and controlled your water and your food and your entry and your exit and everything else, and even the air that you breathe, which they want to control. And then if you refuse that, then you missed an opportunity. And here, here's the thing that's equally disturbing besides Jared Kushner's insulting, demeaning uh, comments. Unfortunately, Jamal, we have to go there and say there are some Arab countries and leaders who are supporting this plan. And I think we need to say that this is part of this, you know, this kind of grand kind of crazy relationship between the Israelis and the Gulf countries and the United States, and we want to remind our listeners that in terms of Gulf states and the negative impact that the Gulf states have had, you know, throughout the region cannot be uh, 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 overstated at all in terms of Yemen, the death of journalists, and including Jamal Khashoggi. But you actually have Arab leaders now who have been willingly or unwillingly coerced into promoting this. What do you call a peace plan when the stakeholders are not part of the plan, dismiss the plan, are not signing on to the plan, and were never involved in the plan, and you have these other regional players telling you take it or leave it? What do we call that? Well, obviously, this is a plan for apartheid. And, and that's slavery. What, that's and slavery. what we basically called it. However, to discuss the... Uh, 
I would say embarrassing act oh, because it's, it's going to come, than, it's it's, gonna come it's back to bite them, you know, where eventually that there were uh, that during the ceremony, uh, actually, there were four representatives or four ambassadors from Arab countries, Oman, the UAE, Bahrain, and I forgot the fourth one. Maybe Kuwait? Three. No, no. Uh, it will come back to me. But anyway, they're just like their poster Arabs, Arabs or house Arabs, as, as we call it. So those are out of the 22 Arab countries were present. So the vast majority of the Arab countries were not there. And now we've see, we've ha we are seeing some overshoots. I wouldn't say that we are seeing major support, but you could see, you could tell. I mean, the writing is uh, basically in the title. You can see them trying to appease to Trump because they have no other options. Like Saudi Arabia, they didn't praise him. He said, oh, this is a good step. This is a good step forward. Yeah. Those are the different messages that Trump has been receiving. They didn't send representation there. Yeah, nevertheless, but, but they're still supporting. Nevertheless, because they, they didn't directly, but they because, didn't condemn it. Because why? They Be didn't condemn it. They didn't condemn it because they have been in Trump's little pocket. When Donald Trump goes to Saudi Arabia and squeezes billions of dollars out of them, say, "Hey, you're you're going to lose your protection. You're going to lose American protection there for your regimes unless you pay me," and comes back with a pocket full of money. And then the Saudi regime assassinate one of its own citizens, cuts him into pieces in their embassy in Turkey. And what did Donald Trump do? He said they didn't do it. He looked the other way. He looked the other I way. I mean, imagine if any other country, when the, the, the United States tries to present itself as the bastion of democracy across the glo globe, and you have someone, not only this person is a Saudi citizen, but he was a resident of the United States, worked for, for one of the largest media outlets, uh, the Washington Post, right in the, in the capital, right. and goes and gets murdered inside the embassy. Yeah, and they get caught red-handed, basically with the saw in hand, so with the blood dripping, and then we just give them a wink and a nod and say, here is a pass. No, but actually it's worse than that, Jamal, because we continue to send arms to Saudi Arabia. We continue to send arms to UAE. We continue to uh, support the, the massive destruction of human life and infrastructure in Yemen that Saudi Arabia and the UAE are in, you know, engaged with, with the people uh, of Yemen. But I want to come back to Palestine. Because, you know, yes, there were none of the uh, major Arab country leaders have condemned this. Saudis have not condemned it. You had a couple of ambassadors there. But where is the rest of the Arab world in condemning this? It's, I mean, I haven't heard Egypt condemn this roundly. Where's King Abdullah? And in some ways, this puts us in the same position where Palestinians, again, have to rely on themselves to stave off this apartheid engagement, this apartheid plan, this attempt to steal more pa Palestinian land. The other thing you didn't man uh, mention, Jamal, is that this is going to re-legitimize the illegal Israeli uh, settlements, the Ill illegal Israeli settlements on Palestinian land. Th I read a report today that the construction work on these illegal Israeli settlements, Jamal, the day that the announcement came, they, were, they started to rebuild at double the pace, that the pace of the building of these illegal settlements will increase even more dramatically. So here's good news, bad news. What do you want to hear first? I'll hear the bad news, as usual. The peace plan is dead. There's no peace plan. Right. Okay, we know that. We know that. But the good news is the two-state solution just died formally. Now, you and I have been talking about this for... I don't want to date ourselves, Jamal, but we've been criticizing the two-state solution for many decades now, saying that it's a joke. But this has been part of the fiction of the international community, especially the United States, the EU, 
Um, and, of, and not even the Israelis, but the Israelis were coerced into buying into the fiction of the two-state solution. The, the kind of small silver lining to this is that this officially destroys anyone who, and any idea that a two-state solution is possible. If you look at the plan, if you look at the map, this is not two states. As you said, apartheid, Bantu stands, transfers of populations. So I believe that eventually we're headed to the one-state solution, which is ultimately where this needs to go. So I do believe this is a good news, bad news. In some really crazy way, Jamal, this is ultimately the thing that will um, bring a one-state back to Palestine. Well, yeah, but uh, there is such a thing as a, a one-state when you have a Jim Crow system. That's not one state. And but you still have a one state. South Africa wasn't a two state. The whole Bantu stand concept. No. This is really just, this is, lift. South Africa, you know, actually the situation in South Africa was better, better. Because the, the uh, citizens, uh, the Africans, uh, the black uh, indigenous Africans in South Africa were actually citizens of the apartheid South Africa. Right. You know, they lived in, lived no. in Bantustans. It was better. They were treated as second and third class citizens. They lived in Bantustans and so forth. But this one actually doesn't say this. This says we're going to keep you inside, locked in those Bantustans, but we're not going to make you citizens. Okay, well, you can call yourself Palestinians. You can call yourself that you have a capital in Abu Dis and call it Al-Quds. <laughs> or in Shafat, you know. So it's actually worse than this, but you can still, in a way, it's a de facto one state Absolutely. because Israel controls historic Palestine from the river to the sea, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. I mean, this is, this is the, the scenario now. And, and, and I've been talking about this for a long time. Statistically, Palestinians have the larger numbers in historic Palestine. It We've talked about it, and it will so many times. In fact, it will continue recent to be reports and the Palestinian Authority pr Prime Minister Shati Shteye talked about it actually today. And Palestinians outnumber Israeli Jews by more than 200,000, almost a quarter of a million. So if you looked at it this way, they are the majority living, living as a minority in their own state. Well, that's, that, that was South Africa and, too. And so, so they are the majority. And so for Israel, basically, that's what they're trying to kind of circumvent that definition and saying, well, you can have your own state. Not autonomy, even though it's kind of like autonomy because they control, not even autonomy. It's not autonomy. But you can have your own state. No, you can have the name still, of a state. We still will control everything by air, by land, by sea. By economy, and, everything. And you can call yourself a state. This way we can circumvent saying that it is a one state and it is an apartheid state. But facts are facts. It has been apartheid for the past several years. And it will continue. And it will continue. This not only reinforces it, but it codifies it. Because when Israel annexes the Area C in the West Bank, and which includes the Jordan Valley, whose laws are they going to apply there? Israeli laws. And then the Palestinians who are living there, they are not Israeli citizens. They, are, they don't get the benefits of Israeli citizens. So what are they? They will come under the same thing that happens, Jamal, to all Palestinians who live under the Israeli military control. They will go through the Israeli military justice system, which is brutal. Now, uh, I want to go back before I know. I want to go back to talk about this Jared Kushner. But just wait. <laughs> we have to do a station ID. You're listening to Arab Talk on KPOO. 89.5 FM here in San Francisco. We're broadcasting live from uh, in San Francisco in studio. We're also broadcasting live on Facebook at uh, Jamal Dejani 2. And you can uh, obviously p listen to the podcast later. Now, Jared Kushner, because we should talk about him, not only is he insulting, not only is he dismissive, but in, in some profound way, his level of ignorance, the, he said... And I quote, 
I read 24 books. 25. I read 25 books about the Israeli-Palestinian Israeli peace problem. Therefore, I'm an expert. He's an expert. So the, the level of idiocy, the level of... Not idiocy. He, he actually, I have to say, he's, more, he's insulting just because he thinks that everyone else... Is stupid. Is stupid. He, like, especially Palestinians. That here we have been waiting for the Messiah... And his name is Jared Kushner to come to town and say, I have a solution for you. And I read, I read 25 books. And I guarantee you, he did not read any books by Ilian Pape or the a book or called Edward Said. The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine or Edward Said books or Rashid Khalidi books and so forth. So he comes and say, I read, you know, 25 books. I know it all. I'm in the real estate business. And this is his approach. And by the way, people should ask, who is Jared Kushner? Let's look at who is really Jared Kushner, someone who actually was not e able to meet security clearance. Still doesn't have it. In, to, to go to the White House, who is, who is, here is the nepotism, who is the son-in-law of uh, President Donald Trump, whose father spent time in jail as a felon, and who is very, it's very well known about the Kushners, who is slumlords? Not only slumlords; they are major supporters of illegal colonial settlements and, and have the whole always been. the whole colonial project. So you are bringing someone, not only that the nepotism part, and he does not represent Palestinians, but also historically with a record of advocating for the colonial settling of Palestine with his entire family that uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu, on many occasions, he used to praise him that he knew him since he was he stayed in diapers. Yeah. And he used to go and sleep at his parents' home in his bedroom. So imagine, think about it this way from a legal way that we are, and, and this is also what drives me crazy, unfortunately, about the Palestinian Authority and all these people who put all their eggs in the basket of the United States and all these negotiations. Yeah, I, I also watched uh, President Abbas's uh, speech, the crying and rejecting this, but you know what? You've been working on this for the past years, and you've been receiving so many warnings that the United States is going to do this. Is not, especially Donald Trump, is not going to be neutral in this situation, and yet they continue to. They work kept with to work, and they kept believing in this whole charade, charade, and Oslo. When you knew, I mean, again, we'll talk about not just Jared Kushner, but when you you also knew the history. All that you have to do is read Benjamin Netanyahu's book. He talks about it clearly in his book and his vision. And it is built on his idol, Yitzhak Shamir. This is the murderer. This is Yitzhak yeah. Shamir, yeah. who is basically labeled as a terrorist by, by England, you yeah. know, before killing civilians at the King David Hotel and other places. That's right. That be who became prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu was his dis disciple. He was the ambassador to, of Israel during his administration to the United Nations. And the plan that it's Haq Shamir set was keep making facts on the ground, keep pushing for the settlements and tell the international community, yeah, yeah, we want to talk about peace, but we don't have a partner, which meaning the Palestinians. And so keep delaying it, build more settlements, and build more settlements. So from day one, from even from his first term, Benjamin Netanyahu, he followed in the footsteps of Yitzhak Shamir, keep creating facts on the ground, and going from uh, having less than 200,000 settlers in the West Bank to now having close to a million, 850,000 settlers. So that was their goal, waiting. This is the magical number until they pay, pretty much taken every piece of land they wanted to take. And now they're saying, oh, Jared Kushner tells us, you know, by the way, it's 2020. Let bygone be bygone. It's the year 2020. We cannot look back. Yeah, it's true. Maybe they, they have been stealing your land. I mean, imagine if someone tells our Jewish brothers and sisters, 
Let bygone be bygone about the Holocaust. Unbelievable. Let's not ask for your rights. Let's not hold the perpetrators accountable. What will happen? No. But for him to say, let bygones, you know, like, and oh, and, and, oh we didn't talk about the refugees who also. The refugees, says, are, they're done. They're done. They cannot come back. They cannot come back. They have no claims. You're listening to uh, Arab Talk here on KPOO San Francisco 89.5 FM. This is Arab Talk with Justin Jamal. We have been discussing the, the fiction of the Grand Peace Plan, which when all is said and done, the so-called Grand Peace Plan is nothing but rehashed old failed plans that have insti- attempted to institutionalize apartheid, racism, ethnic cleansing of indigenous Palestinians. So I'm, we haven't heard anything from Europe yet, Jamal. We haven't heard anything else from the rest of the international community. I think the timing of this occurring in the context of the impeachment process is perfect timing politically for the Israelis and for Donald Trump because well, they think they think this. Because one thing I can tell you about the timing, especially when it came to the impeach, impeachment, not a single major network in the United States covered it. Covered it. No, but that's good and I, bad. No, no, I think, I, I think, think it's good and bad. No, no, but I think it's bad for Donald Trump because. But I think it's also bad for the international community and Americans who don't understand this crazy foreign policy that's going to really be hurtful to the national interest of the United no, States. No, I, I don't look at it this way. Just I think also the timing, of course, it was orchestrated between Benjamin Netanyahu, who has been recently indicted. Same day. Yeah. And Same Donald day. Trump, when we're hearing his impeachment trial, trial live on, on, on all major networks. And I think this is, was orchestrated so to kind of drive attention away, take attention away. I don't think so. I think no, it was I really so. intended to fly under the radar. No. So that no one, because you're right, nobody picked up on this. No, no. I think it was created as a distraction. I mean, it had a, a, a two-pronged plan. One, as a distraction from the impeachment. Which didn't work. It didn't work. And then the other one, to have a victory lap for the elections to say, because this is one of his promises that Donald Trump made, I'm going to build a wall. And we saw yesterday a big chunk of that great wall. It fell over. Fell over because of some wind. Imagine. <laughs> and he, he said, it's going to be the greatest wall ever. So again, he said, this is the deal of the century. And he wants to have this victory lap and say, you see, we've, we've made peace between Palestinians because he assumes that Palestinians are desperate. They are stupid. The Arab world is pretty much broken. It is broken. Not pretty much. It know, is broken. With all the wars. And he has in his little pocket those uh, despots in the Gulf states. And other places. And other places. So he thought, I'm going to have my victory lap. That's yeah. one. Uh, that's the other component of it, which he'll get neither. Okay, but listen, we only have a few more minutes today. We're going to be talking about this fake peace plan for a long time, but there is also breaking news, Jamal. I'm, I'm getting requests from viewers saying, please don't use the word peace. What, should, what word should we use? Apartheid plan. Apartheid plan. Well, to add insult to injury, Jamal... In addition to the United States and Israel stealing Palestinian land, creating apartheid Bantu stands, denying the right of return of indigenous Palestinians back to their homes, U.S. officials are now investigating a real possibility that the U.S. Border Patrol agents have been instructed to profile Iranians, Palestinians, and Lebanese coming into this country. U.S. Customs and Border Protection officials said Thursday that they are investigating a newly found document that instructs these federal border agents in Washington state to profile people of Iranian, Palestinian, and Lebanese background. CBP officials in Washington have detained dozens of Americans and Greek card holders of Iranian, Palestinian, and Lebanese heritage recently, especially the Iranian community after what happened. Uh, in Iran recently, and they've been holding them and tried to return them as they've been coming back to the United States. They've been de- denied entry and tried to and uh, sent back to Canada. I think this is really a big news, Jamal. I mean, we've known this for decades, 
that we've been profiled, that Arabs, Muslims, uh, people of color from North Africa, the Middle East, and the Arab world have been profiled forever. But this is a documentation to actually illegally profile Iranians, Lebanese, and Palestinians at the border. This is kind of big news in terms of institutionalizing this Islamophobia and this racism against uh, these communities. Well, I mean, we know about uh, Trump's Muslim ban, which uh, they've denied saying it's not, it's, not it's, a, it's about security, it's not a Muslim ban, by expanding it to a few other countries in Latin America and wherever, or let's call it uh, Trump's uh, brown people ban. And then now he's talking about expanding it, which, by the way, for example, if you want to talk about this, Iran is part of that Muslim ban, yes, uh, initial Muslim ban. But it's news to me that Lebanese are part of it. That is breaking news. So this is new. And so it tells you this has nothing to do with that, but now it has to do with the political uh, status of our relationship with these countries right. in a way because Lebanon is has appointed a government to the, the disliking of Donald Trump. Right. So so because of that change, there they've been added and because Palestinians didn't has, come to the table has rejected his uh, plan, they have been added. So to me it's not a surprise and not to mention of course the recent attack and the assassination of Soleimani. Well, uh, the United, so, the, so it's the, not a surprise to me that no. Iran, Lebanon and Palestine ha have been added to this extra scrutiny. Now we we do have an advocate in the Congress. It's representative uh, uh, Pramila Jayapal. She is requested she's the uh, Democratic uh, Congresswoman from Washington. Actually, she's been really active in the uh, Democratic caucus and the impeachment hearings. And she has requested an immediate meeting with CBP officials in the Seattle field office and is working to verify this document. And she said it's becoming increasingly clear from multiple conversations with travelers and staff that there indeed is a directive from the Seattle field office to target basically Iranian, Palestinian, and Lebanese yeah, and, people. Yeah, and the difference is now that you have a document, so you have it in black and white, when before you used to hear from different people, especially the past month we've heard uh, a lot from uh, Iranian Americans saying that they were getting stopped and, and harassed and searched and they had to wait for hours on, on the borders. And then, you know, the response has always been uh, no, we don't have a policy like this. You know, this is just maybe... It's uh, not a formal policy. It's not so a formal policy. So now at least people it's know a formal policy. that it is a formal policy. So with a little remaining time, Jamal, we, after talking about this is uh, probably Nekhmed number three or four for Palestinians, you know, this peace plan is a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Palestinians will never accept it. I have breaking news for Jared Kushner. And Ambassador, Ambassador Friedman and, and all of these individuals and Donald Trump and Mike Pence and Mike Pompeo and all of these guys. I guarantee you 100% uh, Palestinians will never, ever accept being subjugated on their own land. Palestinians will never accept being slaves on their own land. Palestinians will never accept anything less than freedom, dignity, and justice on their own land. Now, to talk about your, I know how much you you really care for Jared Kushner. There's only one other person you probably care about more than Jared Kushner. Dershowitz. Alan Dershowitz. <laughs> <laughs> so, Who, by the way, was one of the attendees. I mean, he's not an ambassador. He's not a government official. But he attended this. He actually was invited to the ceremony, seated next to Pompeo, Patting him on the back when uh, President Trump referred to Pompeo, uh, saying, oh, how great it was that he actually attacked. insulted and attacked an NPR reporter, a yeah. reporter, right, and called her names to boot. And then looking at the when the camera panned out to the audience, Alan Dershowitz was patting Pompeo on the back. And he was asked about this on CNN and saying, what's up with this? Do you support the administration attacking reporters and say, no, 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 this wasn't about this. I just like Pompeo because he and I 
think the same way when it came to the Middle East and the peace because they consulted with me about this. I'm not part of the team. Nevertheless, they consulted with me, and I think he is the greatest Secretary of State ever. So this is this is how Alan Dershowitz basically is willing. Well, well speaking. You know, just the same way defending O.J. Simpson and defending Epstein and, and whatever. But let's, He's now defending Donald Trump, right? Well, well uh, Alan Dershowitz has a new defense of uh, Donald Trump in the impeachment process. It used to be Donald Trump didn't do this quid pro quo. It used to be everything that the Democrats are saying never happened. Well, now, as of yesterday, Alan Dershowitz's new defense of Donald Trump is... So what? So what? <laughs> if he did it, it's not an impeachable defense. No, if you believe... It's a good thing. It's a good thing for you. And your and, and the United you States. And you think it's a good thing for the United States. Even if it's corrupt. So you can lie, cheat. If you think it's good. If it's good, then it's okay. So really what this is, is a doctrine of what we call monarchical power. Yep. It's the doctrine of the ultimate executive. It's the... The king. It's a king. It's a king pro uh, prerogative. Right. And in fact, the whole Constitution, the reason people came to the United States was to get away from the king and get away from the monarchy. The Constitution was built in establishing the impossibility of ever having a monarch again. It was built on the idea of rejecting supreme executive power. That's why we have the three co-equal branches of government. What Alan Dershowitz is arguing is that if the basically if the president does it and he thinks it's a good idea, even if it's for himself, if he thinks it's in the national interest to act illegally, corruptly and whatever, then it's not an impeachable defense. And he went further than this, Jess. He also said that the, uh, there is a large number of people who don't agree. And, uh, you know, like talking about Trump's basically base supporters. Right. So in a way, if the proceedings continue, they're going to anger a lot of supporters. And that's bad. To anger people. For the country. Look, I have my differences with Alan Dershowitz all my life, and I know how I feel about him when it comes to the Palestinian issue. However, sometimes he made sense. He's, after all, a famous law professor. And I'm not a lawyer, but he made sense making certain arguments. But he's a criminal lawyer. He's but, not a constitutional lawyer. No, but I'm just lawyer. saying, he, now, he sounds even crazy. his peers, he don't have to listen to you or to me about this. His own peers, they're looking at him with their jaws wide open. Yeah, he sounds crazy. That he's free associating. He's not talking about the law. He's just talking about his own personal feelings. So I'm like really amazed that this guy is given a platform right in our Senate floor. But here's the thing. To he, talk about nonsense. But he's going to give, he's giving, he's, uh, he's giving the Republicans who want to let Donald Trump off the hook cover. The, I, I just want to make a comment that I thought was really funny. Alan Dershowitz, like Jared Kushner, so Jared Kushner said, I read 25 books. I'm an expert. And Alan Dershowitz, Dershowitz I'm going to make it a joke. <laughs> he said he had a massage at Epstein's, but he kept his underpants on. Exactly. So here's the Dershowitz. <laughs> okay, right. Dershowitz said, I read a lot of old books. Yeah. I dusted off these I mean, old books. I had books. to make that joke. It's, anyway. a, it's, a, it's an appropriate joke. It's like I didn't inhale. I yeah. smoked weed, but I didn't, I didn't inhale. inhale. Yeah. But uh, Dershowitz's argument is, I read old books. He's not a constitutional scholar. He's a criminal scholar. He's gone against 99% of the entirety of constitutional law analysis about impeachment. If you actually believe that the president can do no wrong, we no longer have uh, a constitution. We don't have a republic. We don't have a constitutional republic That's right. with three co-equal branches. What we have is the supreme executive doctrine, which goes against everything that the founding fathers and, and mothers, we have to include the mothers in this, the founding fathers and mothers believed from the very there day. I don't think there were any signers, you know, sadly. To, yeah, but the to mothers the were still at home were, taking care of business. They so, were, you know, but, we have to, you know, they didn't but sign, but they, they were there. Sign. But anyways, I think what we're moving into, Jamal, is this particularly dark period uh, intellectually, uh, politically, 
and we talked about this last week, because I don't think, even with the craziness of Alan Dershowitz advocating for monarchical power and for the power of the supreme executive, that you will find, I still don't think it's you know in the bag, you'll find four Republican senators who will ask for witnesses. And asking for witnesses is no big deal. Yeah, you'll get John Bolton to come. Yeah, you'll get other people to come. They will say, yes, the president did this. He had this quid pro quo. He acted illegally. He withheld uh, military support until President Zelensky of the Ukraine was able to do him a favor. But ultimately, they're going to go back to the Dershowitz analysis, which is, so what? That's the Republican analysis today. So what that Donald Trump, it, it doesn't reach an impeachable defense. If we go in that direction, we're headed for a dark period. And I'm sorry to say this again, Jamal. Looks like Donald Trump is on a roll. Hate to say it, man. Well, uh, as far as uh, dominating the conversation, as far as support and basically petrifying the members in the Senate, I think all these politicians are scared. It's not like doesn't mean that they support him, but they're afraid of him. It's no different to me. I though. know, but I'm just telling you this. So the question is, and this is, it, in my opinion, it's for the Democrats to lose. They've already lost. No, I don't think so yet. Yeah. It's for the Democrats to lose. Donald Trump is beatable. And, and, and this is where you and I kind of have our differences. But I agree with you. If the Democrats keep playing the same games that they played before, trying to throw Bernie Sanders under the bus. Which they're doing. Trying to push like their model candidate like they've done before with Hillary Clinton, they will lose. Well, here's but breaking. But if, if they let people vote as they're supposed to and they get the proper nominee, and give all the support, like you know, last but, minute you're get you're getting uh, uh, Bloomberg running well, I was just and throwing say, millions and but I was just dollars gonna, in the in Jamal. The, well, why don't you put the millions of dollars into into defeating it's not Donald happening. Trump? Because Jamal, and I know that Bloomberg is your third favorite person from New York. He's gonna he's, okay. he's gonna split the Democratic vote. Well, that's the scary thing and about we'll, it. And this is what's going to happen. That's why I said They're I agree with you. If they self-destruct, I agree with you. Guess what? Breaking news, everybody. The Democrats are self-destructing. And on that note, we've come to another end of Arab Talk here on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. Check out all of the Arab Talk shows at our website where you can get our podcast, ArabTalkRadio.com. Go to our Twitter account at Arab Talk Radio or at Arab Talk. Arab Talk. Arab Talk. And go to Jamal's uh, Facebook page, We're Jamal Dejani. We're also on iTunes, podcast, everywhere. SoundCloud, everywhere. We'll see you next week. See you next week.